Thank you very much to BGRI for this great opportunity to uh, update you all on our speed reading technology for wheat. As you all know, uh, wheat breeding can be quite a slow and long process. Um, and here you can see a visualization of the breeding pipeline with some of the key phases involved. So we have the crossing and inbreeding phase, the extensive testing for yield, disease, and quality, and, and then seed increase and release of that uh, final product uh, for the farmers to grow. But if we look at the crossing and inbreeding phase, a plant breeder uh, chooses the best lines in his breeding program uh, for starting the next cycle. And so that's done through crossing, and, and these, these, all these genes are all recombined. However, after crossing, um, unfortunately, it needs to go through a series of, of inbreeding and selfing generations to generate uh, homozygous lines that are genetically stable uh, to enter this extensive testing program. And if every year is, if, every, if only one generation is performed um, each year in the field, it can take up to seven years to develop these F6 lines. However, um, the introduction of systems like shuttle breeding um, approaches by Dr. Norman Borlaug at CIMIT essentially achieves two generations a year. And so this um, shrinks the whole uh, process by about half. Another very useful technology, it's been a, a massive revelation for plant breeding, is double haploids. And so it's really shortcutting and by bypassing this whole um, uh, process of traditional self-pollination cycles and rapidly generating homozygous lines. So we go from seven years to two years. However, there's several um, disadvantages with using this technology. There's, there's no opportunity for early generation selection that a lot of breeders like to apply. This low recombination equivalent to the F2 stage. And there's the efficiency varies across germplasm and crosses, and it's considered to be quite laborious and, and or expensive. So when, especially when we think about using this tool in a large breeding program, uh, generating tens or hundreds of thousands of breeding lines, it can be quite expensive. This brings me to the speed breeding innovation. And I suppose um, more than 10 years ago, uh, my, my colleagues were, were really inspired by NASA who were try investing in research who were trying to grow wheat in outer space. And the way that they were doing that were they were exposing the wheat plants to continuous light. So the plants didn't sleep, and this tricks the plants into producing seed very quickly, much faster than normal. And so we thought, oh, what a cool tool this could be to speed up our research and breeding of crops here on Earth. So we started implementing and refining the speed breeding system at UQ, which uses this extended photo periods and controlled temperature to accelerate plant development. And over the last couple of years, we've, we've, our speed breeding protocols have really been in high demand. Um, and we're not the only ones who have set up some really nice protocols for speed breeding. There's a real, the, the guys at the Joint Inner Centre developed some really nice protocols and uh, the University of Sydney. And uh, I think over a period of 12 months, we received more than 100 requests from scientists and plant breeders from more than 24 countries. And so this really inspired us to get together and um, make our protocols available um, and hopefully inspire widespread adoption of this enabling tool. And fortunately, our, pu our publication um, was, was uh, published in Nature Plants earlier this year, featuring on the cover, which sparked a lot of uh, media attention, and which was great for this technology. And um, I have to point out some of the key people involved. Um, the the, the, the co-first authors are both women and triticum awardees, uh, Amy Watson and Shreya Ghosh, who did a lot of these experiments and compiling all these big data sets that we presented to highlight the power of speed breeding. And uh, of course, Dr. Brandon Wolf, who led a lot of the effort setting up uh, speed breeding at the John Innes Center. With speed breeding, we can achieve up to six generations per year, which is pretty impressive. And the way we do it is we use 22 hours light, two hours dark, and during the light phase, we give the plants 22 degrees, and during the two hours of dark, 
we give them 17 degrees. There's a little recovery. We're nice to the plants. And incidentally, speed breeding works for a whole bunch of other crops. So for barley and chickpea, we can also achieve up to six generations per year. And for canola, we can achieve up to four, compared to just uh, two or three in the regular glasshouse. And here's some beautiful comparison photos of the different crops. Um, these plants were grown so on, on the same day uh, under the same temperature regime, but different conditions for the photo period. So speed breeding using the 22 hour light and regular glasshouse control using 12 hour light. And you can just see how dramatic the rate of development is across these species. And the list is really growing. So we've demonstrated it works on bread wheat, durum wheat, barley, uh, chickpea, canola, pea. Others have developed really nice systems for peanuts, uh, amaranth, quinoa. Um, there's people working on protocols for peppers. Uh, and so the list is really continuing. And here's a really nice uh, time lapse um, just to fully convince you guys of how fast these plants grow. Um, speed breeding on the left, uh, really taking off and uh, starting to elongate now. Starting to produce flag leaves. And while the normal breeding plants are still in the vegetative phase, the speed breeding plant is flowered now. Grain filling and approaching maturity. So it's pretty fast. And um, the really cool thing about speed breeding is that there's no one recipe. It's highly flexible in how you adopt this system. For instance, at UQ, uh, we have adopted uh, temperature controlled glass houses fitted with supplemental lighting. At the John Innes Center, they originally set up their Conviron growth chambers to accelerate their research. And at the University of Sydney, they use um, a pretty innovative low cost um, growth room lit exclusively with LEDs. And they're using this system to speed up some of their rust research and, and back crossing efforts targeting new rust resistance genes. And this, this, we can actually harvest the spikes uh, two weeks after anthesis, um, green. So the seeds are green. And we pop them into an Air Force dehydrator at 35 degrees for a few days, speeds up the maturing process, and they come out brown and but quite shriveled. Um, alternatively, we can wait an extra two weeks uh, and reduce the watering and harvest the grains at full maturity. And this is what they look like if you harvest them at, at the very early stage, two weeks after anthesis, they're quite shriveled, but, but once they absorb the water, we put them in the fridge for a few days and pull them out, they germinate. This is because um, the, they don't actually germinate very well without this cold treatment because there's an imbalance of ABA in the grain at this very premature stage. And this means that there's no need for this TDRM, tedious uh, embryo rescue process in the lab. We can handle very large numbers of grains which are really needed for plant breeding. So if we have a look where speed breeding fits into the pipeline, it's about shrinking this whole crossing and inbreeding phase and has a huge potential to accelerate genetic gain in breeding programs. Where does it fit in the breeders' equation? Well, to some degree, we want to increase a lot of these elements on the upper part of the equation. Um, however, the, the denominator, which is really time and the length of the cycle, is exactly where speed breeding and shuttle breeding fits in. Excitingly, there's a whole pipeline of new wheat varieties coming through Australia that are being bred exclusively under speed breeding conditions. The first has just been released in partnership with Dow AgriSciences. It represents Australia's first high protein milling wheat with tolerance to pre-harvest sprouting. A totally new trait on the market. Most of our varieties are susceptible to sprouting. And the way that we did this is that we did repeated cycles of back crossing and selection for high levels of grain dormancy to provide this protection, all in the speed breeding system. So um, we introduced this novel trait. I hear you ask, what other traits can we measure in the speed breeding system? Well, we, we showed really nicely in the Nature Plants paper, these experiments performed at the John Innes Center, and beautiful photos showing that we can precisely phenotype uh, several physiological traits like awn morphology, some of the green revolution, dwarfing genes after only four weeks, 
and flowering time alleles and uh, waxiness mutants. One of the key traits that my group's interested in uh, is root architecture. And you heard yesterday from Hannah and Samir about the clear pot method and some of the work that they're doing. But, and Cecile Richard, one of my former PhD students, uh, developed this system. During her PhD, she actually combined the clear pot method with speed breeding to rapidly perform selection um, for a wide root angle and narrow root angle and rapidly generated BC1, F4 derived lines within only 18 months with extreme root systems. So this is a very powerful tool to, to speed up our pre-breeding efforts and validation of traits too. We've developed a whole series of uh, disease resistant screening methodologies. In fact, um, Zach Pretorius and, and Robert Park developed a really nice system for stripe rust. Um, we've continued some of that work for other diseases like, like tan spot adult plant resistance led by my PhD student Eric Dinglesan and uh, Adnan Riaz has developed really nice systems for leaf rust APR and stem rust APR. There you can see some nice differences we see for the SR2 locus. Um, and the John Innes Center crew showed really nicely that you could select for Fusarium heblite resistance in the speed breeding system. Another really nice application of this tool is tapping into gene banks uh, to uh, in search for new allelic diversity. And one of the collections that we're working on is the Vavilov Week collection. A lot of my students are mining this collection for new alleles for disease resistance, uh, like Delani for adult plant resistance to stripe rust, Ragu uh, for, for seedling resistance to stripe rust, and um, while uh, Ragu and, and others are, are, are busy trying to clone these genes. Um, we're also using the speed breeding system to not only develop those populations that are needed to map them really quickly, but also rapidly back cross these new alleles into adapted material. So in order to, to make this tool um, uh, widespread and, and actually used by breeding programs, one of the key things we have to do is reduce the costs of operating. And so that's where LEDs come in. And at UQ, we've actually replaced all of our old sodium vapor lamps with the latest generation in LED lighting, providing only the wavelengths needed for healthy plant growth. So the blue and the red spectrums only. And this means it's cheaper to run electricity-wise. It also is reducing less um, heat load for cooling that environment. And we've used these heliospectral lamps at UQ, but incidentally, um, the John Inner Centre have also really scaled up their efforts for speed breeding. Um, I love this photo, it's just beautiful. Um, but they've also used the heliospectral lamps. So they're really getting serious, uh, moving, transitioning from the Conviron smaller units to really massive facility. And we can grow wheat at high density. And this is a beautiful experiment performed by Amy in the speed breeding system where uh, we grew them at different densities. And even in the highest density, at 900 plants per square meter, um, the plants are, uh, most plants produce seed and, and many more seeds than what we need to do SSD. And so this is essential for handling large uh, breeding populations and really driving down the costs of developing inbreds in the system. I also hear you ask, can we combine it with other technologies? And yes, we can. And this is the really exciting space. We can use speed breeding to supercharge these transgenic and CRISPR pipelines. So here you can see in the photo um, some transformed calli of golden promise from embryos that were actually raised in the speed breeding system quickly. Um, they were then grown on those transformed plants under speed breeding and regular glasshouse, and you can just see what sort of difference it makes by integrating these tools. And what it means is it saves about three months on the whole uh, transgenic pipeline. I just, Robert Park just updated me, and the University of Sydney are also integrating speed breeding to speed up their double haploid uh, program as well. And what it means is new traits into farmers' fields faster and also, for an academic, it means publishing that nature paper faster. <laughs> and we can use speed breeding to perhaps speed up genomic selection. And uh, we heard from Philemon earlier before the break about genomic selection, essentially shortcutting the need to actually do this field testing and reducing the length of the breeding program. But if we introduce speed breeding, it makes it even faster. 
And um, in fact, Amy, as part of her PhD, has been implementing this on a real uh, wheat population, so which is really exciting. We also performed some nice simulation studies uh, with the help of Eva from Hutisleipik University um, and using real data sets and breeding schemes from CIMIT provided by Susanna. And here you can see after 30 years uh, in the simulations, conventional breeding uh, at the bottom there and, and speed breed GS, where we're combining the tools, much better, an extra 34% genetic gain. Um, and that equates to about half a tonne per hectare from, a, from, from lines coming out of those programs. And Kai, he did the sums, and it works out to be about a, more than a thousand loaves of bread per hectare by integrating these new tools. According to Twitter, speed breeding's been trialled and, and, uh, across the globe. In Mexico, Susanna's set up a, a system where she's trialling it for applications like micro-assisted backcrossing. In Turkey, they're doing something very similar, backcrossing uh, grain quality alleles. Um, and in Minnesota, they're applying it to oats to speed up their, their breeding and research efforts. And lastly, I want to mention some of the uh, opportunities and challenges uh, with this technology, and there are many. Commercial breeding companies are already using speed breeding. For those uh, breeding programs who have not adopted it, certainly it's a major investment in terms of infrastructure or you need to outsource the service. We're really excited about taking speed breeding off the grid. So there's a booming technologies in terms of LEDs, um, batteries, uh, uh, and, and I think it's really exciting where all this is going. There's even laser lights. So there's the, this technology is rapidly evolving, and, we, and it's all about reducing the cost. Winter wheats, unfortunately, Alex, uh, winter wheats uh, still require vernalization, but a lot of people around the world trying to sh troubleshoot this and get this to work in the speed breeding system as well. We saw the gains from combining speed breeding and genomic selection but we are running more vigorous simulations, uh, looking at different breeding strategies, more unique strategies which require program redesign. We're also excited about integrating CRISPR in this whole speed breeding system uh, and possibly reversing alleles in the crossing cycle. I want to thank everyone involved in, in making all these protocols available um, for speed breeding and in particular um, the funding bodies in Australia, the ARC and the GRDC, and I'll leave it there. Thank you.